once again a very good morning to you all today we are having the dissemination workshop on sri lanka's agri food trade structure opportunities challenges and impact of covid-19 to understand the current agriculture trade flow scenario in sri lanka ips supported by the international food policy research institute under the food security policy research capacity and influence program conducted a study on opportunities and challenges in agri food trade in the country as another special dimension the impact of covid-19 pandemic on the agriculture trade in the country was also studied through this today the main objectives of this workshop are to present and discuss the findings of this study and to formulate policy recommendations for export readiness and competitiveness to begin with let me warmly welcome dr suresh babu first dr suresh babu is a senior research fellow and the head of capacity strengthening at international food policy research institute in washington dc he was a senior food policy advisor to the malawi ministry of agriculture on developing a national level food and nutritional information system and evaluation economics for the unicef malawi working on designing food and nutritional intervention programs coordinator of unicef ifpri food security program in malawi during 1989 to 1994 as a senior lecturer at the university of malawi he helped initiate postgraduate programs by developing and teaching computer based policy oriented courses at ifpri he has been involved in institutional and human capacity strengthening for higher education and research in many countries in south asia and sub saharan africa for more than 20 years now i cordially invite dr suresh babu to deliver the welcome remark for the session over to you sir thank you hiruni um first of all let me say good morning to all the participants and good afternoon and uh, good evening wherever they are joining from um it is a pleasure to uh, join the this presentation and followed by panel discussion and question and answer session on the agri food trade in sri lanka uh, in the context of covid-19 as well as understanding the structure opportunities challenges uh, on the regional trade and trade flows uh, in the in the sri lankan uh, context um first of all let me also uh, thank uh, the collaboration that we are having with institute for policy studies um on strengthening the policy research uh, capacity and through that generating evidence based knowledge base for policy making and this program particularly is uh, supported by usaid's feed the future uh, food security innovation lab and uh, with, with the we we call it policy research capacity and influence uh, uh, program um in which michigan state university is taking the lead with international food policy research institute ifpri and cornell university coming together to work with a range of partners in south asia and southeast asia and also in africa in the context of southeast south asia we are working with uh, new delhi uh, based ris uh, nepal based uh, iids and of course sri lanka based ips in south asia in the context of southeast asia from which our participants have joined some of them who have also been involved in uh, trade policy research in their own countries in laos in cambodia and thailand so this is a regional program where it intends to generate evidence to collaborative research and strengthening the capacity of the researchers and analysts on a range of policy uh, issues that are addressing food and agricultural sector but also generally in food systems kind of context um and how we can understand and share knowledge from each one of us in the region and thereby our policy makers can have adequate and evidence based information for policy making 
this is the broad objective of the prci the food in food security innovation lab program that we are working in sri lanka with ips um, it has been very successful uh, collaboration so far and as a result of that collaboration as one of the outputs of that collaboration today we are going to see the research that is undertaken by ips uh, researchers after they went through uh, a, a training program on understanding the trade flows and analyzing the trade flows and the methodologies and the data that is involved in understanding trade flows and they have come up with the evidence now which will be presented today and we will be discussing that as part of uh, um, informing the policy makers and also getting the feedback from the actors and 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 players in the policy system in sri lanka and that's the whole objective to open up the discussion and to learn from what is the current context in which we can take the knowledge base that we have for policy making with that a few remarks i would like to thank once again ips for inviting us and and uh, collaborating with us in this project and taking the leadership in sri lanka for uh, the policy research and analysis related to food system as well and i also welcome as part of uh, uh, my remarks um, professor uh, jivika virahiva um, and other colleagues uh, I, i just want to mention the the um, the panelists who will be coming mr roshan rajadurai um ms subhashini abhay singe ms jayani uh, ratnanayake dr asanka vijay singe and and of course uh, my gratitude also goes to uh, dr dushni virakon for facilitating this partnership and um, also thanking uh, nimesha for for nimesha for organizing this with uh, dr manoj tibatuwa uh for all those i thank as well as um, i welcome all the panelists and participants to this uh, uh, uh seminar webinar as well as discussion and question and answer session um thanks uh, so much for the participation uh, uh, and also looking forward to uh, your input in this discussion back to you hiruni thank you dr suresh now i cordially invite dr dushni virakon executive director at ips for the opening remarks thank you very much and let me also uh, uh reiterate our thanks uh, to uh, dr suresh babu we are very pleased to partner with uh, uh, ifpri on various initiatives and and uh, we are pleased to be a part of this uh, program on policy research capacity and influence um, to address issues of um, agri food trade in um, sri lanka Uh, i also extend a very warm welcome uh, to the resource persons uh, eminent uh, a panel uh, that will um, listen to what nimesha has to say and give um, useful feedback i think it's very um, uh, important given the crucial need to uh, promote food security and safety in these difficult times that the activities such as this um, research based uh, 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 programs um try and provide support and and uh, inform the policy uh, decision making processes in our uh, countries as we try to uh, come out of the uh, impacts of the covid uh, pandemic now one thing i noted uh, 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 when i saw that this um, webinar is being organized is that um sri lanka's um, uh, agri or Uh, agriculture sector export more broadly has returned to uh, pre-pandemic levels uh, as of the latest figures that we have but uh, there is a divergence when we look at uh, uh, imports of uh, food if the um, import bill for food and beverages um, is taken up to august of this year there's actually a 25% increase uh, in our um, food import bill compared to uh, the same for 2019 um and this trend of rising food price uh, it prices is not uh, unique to sri lanka i think this is a, a global phenomenon there is so much debate and discussion going on globally today about uh, rising uh, food prices partly owing to um, supply side constraints etc but even as of august i saw the latest uh, figures suggesting that globally uh, food prices are 30 times more expensive today than they were 
a year ago. And clearly, uh, rising food prices uh, impact the poorer. To start with, they impact developing countries more than they impact developed countries. And within our countries, obviously, the poorer households who spend far more of their um, incomes on food uh, tend to be hurt more than the richer uh, households who can afford uh, to pay these prices to some extent. So price increases um, are expected to be um, transitory uh, as, as, as the um, supply disruptions ease. But as the impact of um, COVID-19 um, on the agri-food um, sector subsides, I think it uh, will be that policymakers will have to shift from emergency policy responses. I mean, if we take Sri Lanka, for instance, our emergency policy responses have focused on more on uh, limiting food imports uh, through import tariff hikes, through um, out and out restrictions, etc., and shift to more uh, spending on investments that can enhance um, sector-wide resilience. So we have to move from those um, immediate emergency responses of the last uh, 18 months or so and, and move to policy measures that will um, look at how we can build back um, food sector resilience. Um, and I, I am sure um, even those who are outside of Sri Lanka know that we've embarked on this. There is an emphasis on um, strengthening national uh, food production uh, and, and trying to uh, substitute um, locally produced food for imports as, as much as possible. But we must uh, ensure that in following that policy path, that um, it, it does not involve excessive um, trade barriers, uh, as it can also harm the poor by making um, healthy diets more expensive. So crises like COVID-19, I think, also holds out um, opportunities. There is always a silver lining that they can inevitably spark um, innovation. Um, and the crucial question uh, is not only what agri-food systems uh, system changes might uh, look like in the future, but also um, whether there will be uh, innovations induced by the um, more sort of longer uh, impacting um, factors such as climate change, um, which are also becoming um, a daily sort of uh, concerns when we look at um, food security in our countries. So I, I'm very pleased when I looked at the program that many of these issues are being taken up for discussion about um, appropriate uh, policy responses, about the impact of COVID-19 on the small and medium sectors, about trade policy, trade facilitation issues, and um, looking also um, more sectorally at uh, important uh, agri sectors like the tea sector. And, and I hope uh, that uh, with the presentation um, to be given by Nimesha, that there will be a um, robust discussion and, and policy recommendation on how to shift the odds uh, in favor of uh, bringing about a, a beneficial food system transformation. For our part at the IPS, we'll be more than um, happy to take on board the policy recommendations that will come out of this uh, workshop and try and convey those uh, to the government uh, and, and the key um, policy makers who are bringing in um, accelerated policy changes in, in managing the agri-food sector in, in Sri Lanka and uh, ensure that evidence-based research lies at the heart of uh, those policy um, discussions. So thank you very much. And I um, wish the rest of the program um, every success. Thank you, Dr. Dushni. Now it's the time to present the findings of the study. I invite Ms. Nimesha Disanayaka, Research Officer at IPS, to do the presentation of the study. Thank you, Hiruni. Uh, and good morning uh, and good evening for all the participants. Uh, so uh, let me share my screen.
So um, this study was done uh, basically on uh, Sri Lanka's agri-food trail, uh, especially on the impact of COVID-19 um, of uh, Sri Lanka's import and export sector. So uh, let's move on uh, the COVID-19, um, how COVID-19 has impacted on most of the economies of the countries. So COVID-19 uh, is resulting negative externalities on economic development, especially um, significant reduction of income of the people and rising unemployment and disruptions in the transportation services and manufacturing industries. So all these uh, things um, are affecting on the food and agriculture sector of any of the countries. So when it comes to a country that is uh, facing with any kind of crisis, then that uh, particular country may have some policy responses. Um, that means uh, very short term policy responses to mitigate the um, effects that may come from the COVID-19 pandemic or any kind of pandemic. So such policies uh, may have two objectives mainly supply side objectives or demand side objectives. So in Sri Lanka also for this COVID-19 pandemic, we uh, had these kind of objectives. Uh, for example, uh, in supply side to ensure the sufficient domestic supply and to ensure food safety, uh, to support producers, poor stakeholders and typical policy responses were taken and also for other countries. They were also taken these kind of policy responses. For demand side, uh, to contain uh, rising prices and to support poor customers, uh, these countries are taking various actions. So for Sri Lanka, these kind of policy responses are not made. That means starting from 1960s up until uh, today, Sri Lanka is mainly uh, facing with various kind of shocks. So starting from 1960s, the balance of payment, and then uh, 1973, the first oil shock. So these kind of shocks, the governments are taking various actions, various policy responses. So now we are in the middle of the crisis, COVID-19. It is um, the COVID-19 has resulted in a dual shock on agricultural markets, uh, which uh, has affected both uh, supply and demand. Uh, and the on the uh, supply side, restrictions on movement has disrupted uh, the production. And on demand side, the downturn in consumption across some of the key export markets mm -hmm. led to a cancellation on no orders. So to mitigate the adverse impacts uh, due to this pandemic on Sri Lanka's economy, the government took various uh, policy action so um, for example we could see that um, uh, on uh, 2020 april the uh, government uh, of sri lanka announced temporary suspension of import of non-essential commodities uh, under 156 hs headings which include a variety of food and agriculture commodities so with that background um, let's move on to the agri food uh, international agri food sector in sri lanka especially the um, import and export sector so they are uh, in, in this, uh, you can see uh, the agriculture exports and imports as a share of total exports and imports of Sri Lanka. So in here, uh, starting from 1985 up until 2019, so the uh, shares are um, like fluctuating and uh, they are the blue bars uh, showing the export uh, percentage and averagely it is uh, like 20% from total exports uh, of Sri Lanka and when it comes to imports it's like 12% um, uh, uh, and then if we take a look at the agriculture exports and import share in the world total exports and imports so that also uh, uh, is fluctuating and um, after 2008 the export share of um, uh, uh, agriculture commodities of Sri Lanka has increased uh, and Today, uh, the currently it is like 0.85% and imports it's 0.15%. Uh, so let's move to the agri-food imports of Sri Lanka. So using this Basi data set, uh, the Basi data set is actually provides disaggregated data on bilateral trade flows for more than 5,000 products and 200 countries. So using that Basi data set, um, we did this analysis to find out uh, what is the structure of the agri-food imports of Sri Lanka and what is the um, structure of the agri-food exports of Sri Lanka and the trends and main partners of the uh, countries and likewise. 
So let's move on to uh, the uh, top 10 agriculture imports of Sri Lanka during uh, 2008 until 2018. Uh, so um, according to this data, we could see that uh, the HS uh, four digit uh, level, the top agriculture imports of Sri Lanka were wheat, milk and cream and cane or beet sugar. So let's move on um, each of these commodities. So first, wheat. Wheat uh, is among agri-food imports. This is the highest annual average expenditure is spending on uh, wheat uh, by Sri Lankan government. And Sri Lanka imported approximately 1.19 million metric tons of wheat in 2018. So uh, average annual expenditure on wheat import was approximately uh, 299 million US dollars. Uh, between 2008 to 2018 and uh, the um, we are importing uh, wheat mainly from Canada then uh, secondly from uh, Pakistan and then from USA so the most important part is what happened to the wheat imports during this COVID-19 pandemic so we could see during uh, this COVID-19 pandemic so as a year we, we took 2020 to uh, find out what happened to the um, wheat imports. So there we could see the imported value of wheat during this period was uh, like 250 million US dollars. And in this graph, you can see that um, the uh, uh, forecasted value or the forecasted volume of uh, wheat imports of Sri Lanka. Uh, in here, uh, we can see that uh, 0 0.94 million metric tons of forecasted value was there when uh, these values are taken into consideration the past values are were taken into consideration to find out the forecasted value so that was um, 0 0.94 but the actual import um, of wheat in 2020 was around 1.48 million metric tons it is a huge um, increment than uh, the forecasted value in this COVID-19 pandemic so next let's um, move to milk and cream this is the second largest expenditure uh, uh, imports and average annual uh, expenditure on milk and cream in the same time in 2008 to 2018 approximately metric tons of milk and cream in 2018 so more than 80 percent of the is from new zealand secondly from australia and thirdly but are they the so, um, using uh, these basic data sets, these uh, partners uh, Let's look what happened to the milk and cream import uh, sector. So, Sri Lanka has imported uh, 316 million uh, US dollar worth milk and cream in 2020 during the COVID 19 pandemic. So, nearly 90% of the milk and cream was from. New Zealand and uh, milk and cream however the import volumes show an increasing trend over the years so like we did uh, with the wheat we uh, calculated the forecasted value for the 2020 the volume of uh, milk and cream that would be imported to Sri Lanka and then that uh, value was 96,000 around 96,000 uh, metric tons of milk and cream but uh, however the actual value was uh, uh, bit higher than that forecasted value which was 100,000 100, um, metric tons. So when it comes to the third largest import commodity of Sri Lanka it was cane and sugar beet sugar and that was valued for 276 million US dollars in uh, 2006, 2008 to 2018 and Sri Lanka imported approximately 500,000 metric tons of uh, corn and beet, uh, cane and beet uh, sugar in 2018 and the largest uh, um, sugar import partner of Sri Lanka is India while uh, Thailand and Poland are also import partners of cane and beet sugar. So during uh, the pandemic, uh, what happened to this uh, cane and beet sugar was that Sri Lanka has imported 276 million US dollar worth sugar during 2020. And um, during 2020, 600 
nearly 600,000 metric tons of sugar has been imported. So interestingly, in this year, that means 2021, during uh, the first six months, uh, Sri Lanka has imported nearly 600,000 metric tons of sugar. So uh, the actual imported value uh, for 2020 uh, was more than the forecasted value as uh, usual, as we saw in wheat and milk. So uh, next, in addition to the above wheat, milk and uh, cane and wheat sugar, uh, more agricultural commodities are being imported to Sri Lanka like uh, from various uh, destinations. So altogether, um, in 2020, total expenditure for vegetable import was 352.9 million US dollars. And among these vegetables, dry uh, chili, big onion, red onion, potato, cowpea, brown nuts, and these kind of uh, import items are there. So, uh, as a summary, so behavior of these main uh, input agri food items, so we know uh, uh, so global food prices are in a rising trend, and Sri Lanka too, um, food inflation is on the rise. So, uh, Sri Lanka continues to impose import restrictions on food items, and during the pandemic, government put suspensions, as, as I earlier also mentioned. So, uh, among these, um, temporary uh, ban of imports, palm oil uh, and its fractions, which was uh, the annual import value was uh, 104 million US dollars and rice 91 million US dollars and malt extracts 42 million US dollars were among those temporary restrictions. So however, the main uh, food imports, as I earlier mentioned, wheat, cane and wheat sugar, these food exports in Sri Lanka. So they are uh, actually these are the Russia, India, uh, Germany and Mexico. These are the main agri-food export that we are exporting to these um, destinations. So in, in, uh, by using this Abasi data set, HS4 digit level can export agri-commodities were uh, taken into consideration and um, first uh, the most uh, the, and the highest export agri commodities were analyzed uh, further. So, uh, in, in as uh, we can observe in here, so tea, cinnamon, uh, coconut, abaca, rami, and uh, coconuts, natural rubber, pepper, fish fillets, these are the uh, main uh, agri uh, food in exports of Sri Lanka. So, uh, this is the fluctuation um, of those commodities in metric tons. And let's move to the leading agriculture export commodity of Sri Lanka, that is tea. So when it comes to the tea, uh, in this graph, we can see uh, the how the volume and the uh, uh, value of these tea exports were changed over the years. And 2019, Sri Lanka is the largest orthodox tea producer and fourth largest uh, global tea producer and third largest exporter of tea in the world. So in 2019, the total tea production was about 349,000 metric tons per annum and the tea production accounted for 0.7% um, of the GDP. And more than half of the tea product produced is exported to international markets and uh, annual average export revenue uh, between 2008 and 2018 was like 1,362 uh, million US dollars. And however, the uh, value, export value and the export quantity are in a declining trend. So next, um, let's see the tea export destinations. So using this Basi database, we could identify who are the main um, export uh, destinations. And um, that means in the past, who were the export destinations and now whether we are uh, relying on them and whether uh, they are the still, they are the uh, main exporters of Sri Lanka. So uh, likewise, in um, 1998 to 2002, we, we uh, wanted to look at uh, who were the main export uh, destinations of tea. So there are, we could identify Russia, uh, United, United Arab Emirates and Turkey were the uh, main three export um, uh, 
uh, partners of Sri Lanka for tea. And uh, then for the current lead for 2014 and 2018, so interestingly, Azerbaijan and Germany had entered among the top 10 uh, export partner countries. So, however, the Russian uh, Federation has maintained the first place in ranking while uh, Iraq and Iraq, Iran are the uh, second and third places uh, overtaking um, Turkey and UAE. So, with that, um, the most important part is what happened to this tea export sector during COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, the 2020, the export revenue from tea that we generated was around 1200 million US <laughs> and this is a decrease of 7% from 2019 export value that was uh, 1300 um, million US dollars so tea export volume uh, in 2020 was um, around 265000 metric tons and a 9% decrease from 2019 volume of tea exports so, however, uh, like we did for imports, the forecasted value uh, for the volume of tea was uh, forecasted and that value was actually uh, 284,000 uh, metric tons. But the actual uh, tea volume that was exported was um, a little bit lower than that value that was uh, 265,000. So, therefore, uh, in, in, in this scenario, the supply and demand shocks uh, due to COVID-19 might also be the reason for the negative performance of tea sector of Sri Lanka. So currently, there are many issues and challenges associated with the tea sector and they may have also triggered the supply shocks. So the possible reasons for the negative uh, export performance of tea might be like the existing challenges of the uh, sector. So we know uh, Sri Lankan tea is uh, more expensive in the global market as Sri Lanka has the highest cost of production. But uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Kenya uh, are producing tea at low price. So therefore, they are offered tea at uh, low prices at the international market and make competition to Sri Lankan tea. And uh, we know how our tea basket consists. That means more than 50% of the tea is. Uh, exported as bulk form and the valid addition uh, uh, section is not that much developed in Sri Lanka and uh, also another challenge is we are depending on traditional buyers and we do not um, go beyond that traditional uh, main uh, tea exporters and find out new markets in uh, like in other countries so um, so that the main finding of this study uh, was like uh, what is the uh, main export uh, commodity uh, from Sri Lanka, uh, the ex agriculture commodity of Sri Lanka, and then what uh, what are the export potentials that are existing in the outside markets, and how can we tackle those uh, export potentials? So, like um, when it comes to the commodity, so uh, altogether the black tea uh, shows an absolute difference of potential. Um, between the actual value and the uh, potential value of 777 uh, million US dollar worth. So that kind of potential is uh, still there at the uh, tea market and we can um, go for that target. Uh, so that is a room to grow. And when it comes to the countries with uh, main export potentials, the United States and the Russia show the largest absolute difference between potential and actual exports um, in uh, value uh, terms and with the additional export worth of 103 uh, US dollar million. So uh, UK, India, China, Pakistan are also having considerable untapped potentials uh, with their economies for tea. So next, uh, the second largest agriculture export commodity in HS4 level is Ceylon tea, Ceylon cinnamon. So uh, in here, the spices sector is one of the biggest export revenue earning sector in Sri Lanka. So cinnamon is um, by uh, far the most important and valuable product among all the spices of Sri Lanka. So uh, Sri Lanka occupies its sole dominant position in Ceylon cinnamon production. And uh, before the pandemic, Ceylon cinnamon exports were experiencing continuous growth in the global market. So in 2018, the export uh, value reached 
190 million US dollars and Sri Lanka accounted for 62 percent of the global cinnamon um, export so in this graph you can see the uh, the value of uh, export and the quantity of export of cinnamon and both are in a uh, increasing trend so uh, next cinnamon export destinations so there are also uh, we analyzed uh, the main export destinations during 1998 to 2002 and 2014 to 2018. so they are the leading importer of sri lanka ceylon cinnamon in 2020 was usa but in these two periods that was mexico and the second um the largest export destination was usa and then peru likewise but um in this with this covid 19 period these export destinations have been changed a little bit uh, that change was uh, like in 20, uh, 2019 and 2020 the traditional importing countries like mexico which used to be sri lanka's leading destinations for ceylon tea decreased their imports uh, by up to 70 percent so uh, countries like uh, colombia and ecuador have increased their ceylon cinnamon imports considerably over the last year so we can see a shift of these uh, main export destinations of cinnamon over the years especially with this COVID 19 pandemic so however the uh, uh, the sector uh, impact of COVID 19 is considerably um, well and uh, it has performed well so that is the export revenue from cinnamon in 2020 was like 227 million us dollars so it's a very huge amount uh, when it compared to 2019 uh, amount in 2019 it was like 187 million us dollar amount but um, so therefore amount is uh, has increased by 21 percent so in 2020 uh, sri lanka accounted 55 percent uh, 54 percent of the global export share of cinnamon um, in the world so for um, like did for tea uh, the cinnamon um, export volume also was forecasted for the 2020 so the forecasted value was 18,000 metric tons but uh, the actual um, export uh, value of cinnamon from Sri Lanka was 19,000 so that is an increase of uh, export value uh, with these um, kind of uh, facts that we can say that cinnamon exports have performed extremely well in 2020 but not like tea so with this COVID-19 lockdowns this has performed well the reason may be uh, due to the demand uh, for Sri Lankan uh, cinnamon um, which was also uh, as a result of COVID-19 so this cinnamon industry is not free of challenges and free of bottlenecks so there are many Ceylon cinnamon faces competition with uh, major importing countries like Vietnam, China and Indonesia. They are actually uh, exporting cashier cinnamon. Uh, so uh, that is dominant with affordable prices, not like our prices. So the high prices of Ceylon cinnamon is due to the uh, limits in production volume and the uh, inefficient cost structure and likewise. So a lack of um, proper production infrastructure and technology is also um, affecting on the high prices of this cinema and um, likewise there are many challenges so these challenges might affect on the industry in the future uh, in a uh, negative way but however with this COVID-19 it was a well-performing industry so for uh, the cinema industry the export potentials were very so we can see in here for India uh, now we are uh, the actual exports for India is 5.4 um, million US dollar worth of cinnamon is for India and the export potential that was untapped and that uh, we have the room to growth is like 88 uh, million US dollars it's a huge amount and also in USA Bangladesh and Vietnam we have the um, export potential to grow like uh, for for example bangladesh currently we do not export uh, any cinnamon uh, to bangladesh but it has a untapped potential of 28 uh, million us dollars per cinnamon so uh, reaching out these potentials might be important for the betterment of this uh, export agriculture sector of the country 
So next, uh, uh, another important sector for HSCO digital level uh, of the uh, export agriculture sector in Sri Lanka is natural rubber exports. So uh, the reason why I am selecting this for the further analysis is like we can see in this graph the uh, volume and the uh, value of this natural rubber exports of Sri Lanka is declining trend um, uh, starting from 2010 and 2011. So up until now, it's in a declining trend. So total uh, natural rubber export value um, in 2018 was like 45 million US dollars. So um, due to the rapid growth of natural rubber, uh, demand globally investment uh, in the rubber sector is highly profitable. So rubber products have significant market potentials in the world. So with this COVID-19, it has been increased. So Sri Lankan natural rubber includes mainly uh, crepe rubber followed by sheet rubber, block rubber and other rubber types and export quantities um, of natural rubber uh, were in a declining trend over the past years, actually, as I explained. So um, when it comes to the natural rubber export destinations, like uh, we did for other uh, commodities as well, in uh, 1998 to 2002, uh, the main exported destinations of natural rubber were Pakistan, Germany, and U United States of America. But in uh, 2014 to 2018, Pakistan was uh, as the same uh, rank uh, that means that is the um, uh, main export uh, destination of Sri Lanka for natural rubber. So uh, in this period, the uh, Pakistan, Japan, U USA, Germany and Malaysia were about top export destinations for natural rubber. So um, the quantities of exported rubber has decreased as we can see in this uh, graph. So uh, the quantities have drastically decreased for all the export destinations. So uh, like in here, the impact of COVID-19 on natural rubber export is um, very valid to uh, analyze. And in here, in 2020, in 2020 uh, the natural rubber export uh, value was like uh, 30 um, US dollar million, and that is an increment of 24% from 2019 export value. With this COVID-19, uh, the uh, uh, because of the uh, high demand in the market, so this amount of um, increment could be observed. So uh, the uh, therefore, the natural rubber export have performed well in 2020, but up until then, the uh, sector performance was not that much good. So the reason for this is uh, the uh, rubber and rubber products went up uh, the demand went up and that is uh, why uh, the uh, values are high. So uh, the challenges of this natural rubber industry, uh, so we know uh, the global marketing costs are uh, unbearable as the volume offered by Sri Lankan manufacturers is small compared to the large global manufacturers and marketing strategies are critical to staying competitive in the global market, but we do not uh, use that much of marketing strategies for this uh, rubber and the percentage of global branded Sri Lankan rubber product is not significant likewise. So uh, the export potential for natural rubber is like uh, Malaysia uh, is the country which um, has a uh, 6 million US dollar untapped potential uh, for the natural rubber. And in China, uh, India, USA, Belgium, Belgium and Iran also having um, the untapped potentials for natural rubber exports. So the next uh, food item uh, of uh, this export uh, agriculture sector in Sri Lanka is fish. So the reason why I'm uh, selecting this uh, item for the further analysis is that this is like an emerging agri-food sector in Sri Lanka. So fish, uh, we know Sri Lanka has a well-established fishery industry and there are around 14 deep sea fishing harbors in Sri Lanka. So. Um, in this, uh, when the fish export sector is considered, the highest export revenue comes from fish fillets and other fish meat. That is HS0304 um, uh, category. So in, in this graph, you can see the value and the volume uh, that is exported to other countries. So it's in a, a it's like fluctuated over the time. And when it comes to the uh, main export destinations of these uh, fish fillets, so uh, top 10 uh, export partners during 1998 to 2002 were like UK, Australia, Switzerland, France, uh, Germany, likewise. And 2014 and 2018, 
uh, USA, Italy, France um, uh, had entered among the top uh, 10 export partner countries, which is a good move because we have moved to new export destinations for fish fillets. And um, Australia, Switzerland and Sweden have fallen to lower positions currently. This shows some diversification of export di uh, destinations over the years. So uh, then if we look at the export potentials that are currently in the market uh, for fish and fillets, so Japan uh, and Germany uh, have the uh, largest uh, untapped potentials for fish and fish uh, fillets and other fish meat exports. So like for Japan, uh, the actual uh, export is like uh, 0 0.41 uh, million uh, US dollars and it, it is having another 0 0.75 million US dollar potential. Likewise, we have a huge potential in the market if we uh, are trying to go for that uh, market. So with that um, uh, brief uh, analysis of the uh, main export and import um, uh, commodities. So if we look at the summary of this uh, study, like COVID-19 uh, has resulted negative externalities and as I uh, explained uh, this impact has affecting the uh, food and agriculture sector of countries. So uh, Sri Lanka is more susceptible to external and internal shocks as it is highly dependent on external trade and therefore uh, as a middle income country uh, Sri Lanka should immediately identify the emerging trade patterns, opportunities and challenges to face the upcoming trade competitiveness due to COVID-19. So uh, if I uh, so, uh, very briefly say uh, wheat and milk cane uh, beet sugar are the top three agri food import commodities of sri lanka and all of them observed with a significant decrease uh, significant increase uh, of their uh, import volume during the pandemic so however uh, main food um, imports such as wheat uh, sugar are showing declining trend in their import volumes over the past few years so uh, likewise uh, supply and demand shocks due to COVID-19 might be reason for the negative performance of the uh, tea sector in Sri Lanka. So currently there are many issues associated with this industry. So before the uh, pandemic, Ceylon cinnamon uh, exports were experiencing continuous growth in the global market. So due to the rapid growth of natural rubber uh, demand globally, investing in the rubber sector is highly profitable. So however, uh, natural rubber exports have performed well in 2020. Uh, with the COVID-19. So when it comes to the fish fillets and fish meat sector, uh, that is an emerging uh, food uh, export sector in Sri Lanka. This is the uh, summary of these um, results. And then finally, when it comes to the policy recommendations, so the policy should be um, uh, developed in a way uh, that uh, finding out the solutions to um, give uh, actually um, to mitigate the uh, negative externalities uh, due to COVID-19. So it may be a long-term uh, uh, one or, or a short-term one. Still, we are dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So that uh, study found uh, untapped export potentials in various markets, so existing um, uh, markets and emerging markets and also niche markets. So uh, to tap this untapped um, untapped potentials, various strategies should be taken. So one is like seek for new emerging export destinations. That is uh, called blue ocean strategy. So uh, we should uh, tackle the countries where the competition is very low. Uh, because for tea, for example, we saw there's a huge uh, competition in the world for tea. And uh, if we go for another markets also which are with low competition for the uh, exports then it would be a very uh, comparative advantage for the uh, tea exports of sri lanka and also product diversification so as i earlier also uh, explained um, for tea for cinnamon the value addition is a little bit uh, low in sri lanka and we are still um, um, relying on the bulk export products and these should be um, like the products diversification should be um, an important um, consideration and the adapt to um, modern technology should be done in a, a way that um, most of the countries are doing uh, like um, taking the modern technologies to um, 
making their productions. So uh, another uh, thing is that use, using digital marketing strategies like blockchain methods, especially for the tea uh, export sector of Sri Lanka. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Nimesha. Now the space is for the panel discussion. And this session will be moderated by Dr. Suresh Babu. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Hirini, once again. Um, and thank you, Nimesha, for an excellent presentation. And uh, thank you also for the excellent analysis that you have done. Um, and I am going to be kind of uh, calling uh, the panelists uh, and introducing them as we go along. Um, and uh, the presentation itself gave an excellent overview of what um, Sri Lanka's status currently on not only the commodities, top commodities that it is exporting, top commodities it is importing, and what is the structure of that export and import and what implications for that export and import and the partners that they have, uh, um, Sri Lanka has, in the context of COVID-19 uh, as a major shock to the trade and the disruption that it has caused, both from the supply perspective, uh, from the perspective of the, uh, the implications, particularly on economic growth, and uh, the employment and the trade disruptions within within the region um, and the policies that the countries have come up with uh, um, in response to the COVID-19 and how that uh, probably has affected the trade patterns of the food and agricultural commodities in Sri Lanka. With that overview uh, um, that Nimesha presented, we have now uh, in front of us information related to um, what are the implications for the policymakers that we can recommend from various perspectives. One perspective is the supply uh, disruptions, the other perspective is the logistics and uh, a regulatory perspective. The third perspective could be what are the future options that we have in order to build the resilience of the uh, food system, particularly food trade, uh, in the event of um, disruptions like that. And to analyze, debate, and discuss, we have an excellent panel that, uh, that we have put together. And let me start with uh, Professor Jivika Virahiva. Um, uh, Professor Jivahiva, it doesn't require a lot of in, uh, uh, introduction to policy circles in Sri Lanka. She is the professor of agricultural economics, uh, agribusiness, and manage uh, and agribusiness management uh, at the University of Paradinia. A long uh, experience uh, in doing trade analysis, trade policy analysis uh, for Sri Lanka, and of course, and other countries uh, uh, in the region. Um, with that, uh, let me um, uh, start, uh, Professor Jeeva, to, to, to kind of give us a broader perspective uh, about what has been the policy measures that the government of Sri Lanka has adopted to minimize the impact of the shock that, that COVID-19 brought on the food and agricultural trade. We'll come back to uh, other panelists as uh, as uh, Professor Jeeva Hiva starts talking and giving the response, and we'll go uh, at least two rounds of questions with uh, each one of the panelists. Uh, Professor Jeeva Hiva, please uh, uh, come in and uh, and um, address that basic question of what are the policy measures that uh, Sri Lankan government has adopted and 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 in the context of. Uh, the COVID-19 and to impact, minimize the impact of uh, the, the shock. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction as well as uh, for the question. Um, in fact, uh, I would like to elaborate to you uh, the policy measures that uh, the government of Sri Lanka took uh, 
considering uh, the domestic reforms as well as uh, trade reforms because uh, the two aspects are interrelated and uh, whenever we take a, a domestic measure that has uh, implications on trade uh, and vice versa. So when I looked at uh, our policy response, uh, what I can uh, see is that uh, our policy makers were pretty much worried about uh, the status of uh, food security. So some of the measures uh, taken were uh, to address uh, food availability, some others uh, uh, to uh, ensure that uh, food is accessible and uh, also stable and uh, food utilization was also a source of concern uh, to the government of Sri Lanka. So with respect to food availability, what I uh, can see is that uh, of course, uh, the first patient uh, was uh, diagnosed on the 11th of March uh, 2020. So immediately uh, the country was uh, locked down, but uh, agriculture was exempted, like uh, farmers were allowed to work and uh, the government really wanted to make sure that uh, sufficient uh, food is uh, produced. Uh, and at that time, uh, we had uh, a policy of uh, giving free fertilizers so the fertilizers were distributed. Of course, there were disruptions, but the government continued to do that. And uh, also there was uh, a program uh, in the pipeline uh, to uh, propagate uh, home gardening. So one million uh, home gardens uh, were given uh, seeds, uh, planting materials, and even uh, fertilizers uh, to promote uh, home garden food production. I do not uh, consider that as a great policy, but I should mention that because uh, it is uh, one of uh, the biggest uh, initiatives uh, that the government did. And initially, government uh, understood uh, the value of food imports. Uh, so uh, food importation was kind of promoted in the very beginning. Later on, of course, uh, we started restricting uh, food imports and uh, also fertilizer imports. Uh, and uh, even right now, we can see that uh, we are liberalizing uh, slightly or slowly uh, food imports because uh, we, we understood uh, the, the importance of uh, uh, freer trade uh, despite our uh, protectionist move. And uh, also, government uh, took uh, so many measures uh, to control uh, prices, to maintain uh, low uh, prices uh, at the retail. And also uh, the stability of food supplies uh, were a source of concern, like uh, uh, there were uh, uh, controls both on wholesale and retail prices, uh, over 20 food items. And uh, the margin was fixed uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the intermediaries uh, do not exploit. And, uh, also, government uh, converted uh, the tea auction into an e-auction, and uh, actually uh, that uh, covered a few other auctions uh, as well. And government uh, started uh, uh, procurement of fish, vegetables, uh, and fruit. So, th so there were so many interventions, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the government was of the view that uh, this was like the way to go. So, government. Uh, made some of these measures long term and I noted uh, Dr. Virapun saying that you know emergency measures uh, should not be the long term measures but unfortunately uh, that was the route that uh, we took and uh, we uh, fully uh, banned uh, importation of chemical fertilizer later on it was converted to a licensing scheme but uh, still uh, chemical uh, fertilizers uh, are kind of banned and we do not uh, hear uh, giving licenses uh, in a liberal manner. So this actually affected our agri-export sector and thereby uh, export earnings. So, so this, uh, uh, this policy became uh, an anti-export uh, initiative, even though it is meant to be uh, a policy to uh, produce uh, toxic uh, free food and uh, yeah so i think uh, i do not have much time but uh, uh, just to uh, uh, say a few more things about uh, food utilization uh, government uh, provided uh, some monetary assistance uh, to uh, 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 low-income families uh, and uh, 
uh, food assistance uh, programs were continued. Uh, the government, uh, together with WFP, uh, tried to continue uh, school uh, uh, school uh, meal uh, programs. Uh, so there were quite a lot of good measures as uh, emergency measures, but unfortunately, some of those uh, are going to be uh, uh, here in Sri Lanka in the uh, foreseeable future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Professor Jivahiva. This is uh, Virahiva. This is a wonderful uh, kind of. Uh, uh, insight because you are taking from the trade perspective, but uh, you're also looking at the domestic reforms or domestic kind of policies that are put in place, which have implications for trade. I mean, that that uh, uh, kind of outlook usually is missed out in, in the context of the shocks. So thanks for bringing that. Uh, and also, I'm, I'm glad that you talked about uh, the, the restriction in the context of uh, agricultural production activities, they they were not that much restricted in, in due to lockdown no, and so on. So that's that's yeah. a good point that you have made, and also the context of uh, emergency and long term policies, which is always uh, the issue. How do you transition from emergency to long term uh, when when you face with an emergency? Is uh, is also a policy debate that we always have. Uh, but in this context, it's becoming really crucial to look at the transition, uh, whether we, we are doing it right. And you gave the example of the fertilizer uh, ban, uh, on which you have written a policy brief very nicely. And, and uh, uh, that requires a lot more uh, attention in terms of policymakers looking at what are the options and how you can you know, go from this emergency, immediate you know, kind of policy to think in the long term in terms of productivity, in terms of uh, what, what, how it affects the export trade. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful intervention. Uh, let me uh, quickly move on to our next panelist. We'll come back to you, Professor Virohiva, later on, and as we as we talk about it. And also, please please feel free to intervene if you get some points as the other panelists talk. Okay. Um, let's move on to uh, now, uh, Miss Jayani uh, Ratnayake. She is with the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. She is an international trade researcher. And um, uh, Ms. Jaini, we would like to know from your kind of, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce perspective, um, and uh, the, the role of businesses uh, uh, in, in Sri Lanka, particularly small and medium businesses play uh, in the exports, and how particularly the COVID-19 um impacted these smes uh and what challenges this uh, smes faced as a result of uh, the covid 19 in the context of accessing for example suitable markets promoting their business linkages uh and and with, with the large enterprises uh, so to speak and also to reaching out to the international markets let's start with that uh from the perspective of small and medium enterprises and then, and then we'll again come back to you maybe later on uh, for another round of question. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Ms. Jayani, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Suresh. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, you are, you are. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So very good morning and a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so who, to all of you who have tuned in for this uh, very important uh, webinar today. Uh, so to, ask your, uh, to answer your question, Dr. Suresh, uh, I would like to start off um, with a small um, introduction to SMEs. So when we talk about SMEs, I would like to also include the, the micro enterprises as well into the definition so that um, we can broadly uh, refer to them as the, the micro, small, and the medium enterprises. Because when we especially look at the Sri Lankan context, uh, not just Sri Lankan, but globally as well, we know that MSME, MSMEs account for more than 90% of businesses. In Sri Lanka also, it's the same. And uh, it also contributes to over 50% of Sri Lanka's GDP while playing a very important role in promoting um, regional growth as well as employment creation. When we especially um, look at Sri Lanka's economic performance, especially during the pandemic affected 2020, we see that Sri Lanka's GDP contracted by 3.6%, which is 
which was the largest economic downturn that was recorded in the uh, history of our country. So, COVID-19 uh, pandemic had a, an unprecedented level of disruption to the functioning of the entire social economic landscape in Sri Lanka, including the agriculture sector and the agri-food sector. Especially the MSMEs in the agri sector was one of the most vulnerable and therefore one of the less resilient sectors against the COVID pandemic for several reasons. So when we engaged with the MSMEs to understand the impact of the pandemic uh, during its different phases, so in Sri Lanka we say the wave one, wave two, depending on when we had the first curfew initiated and then the second of uh, economic lockdowns initiated. So one of the key um, uh, insights that we got from them was that the impact was mainly felt through uh, disruption to the supply chains. So as a result, it made it difficult for them to reach out to their markets using the usual channels. So when I say markets, I refer to both the domestic market as well as the export-related global markets as well. Due to these uh, shop supply chain disruptions, um, there were working capital related problems as they did not receive payments for goods that they supplied on time. And at the same time, there was a substantial reduction in some of the other income sources that they usually uh, received as well. And finally, there were also many price escalations. Uh, for the raw material that they need to source, both locally and to exports, the availability of raw material as well due to the economic downturn that was experienced from the defensive aspect. So when we really talk about the impact, very important uh, aspect that we need to look at is the inter-business linkages between the MSMEs and the large exporters. So when we especially look at the uh, agri food sector as an example, what we see is that in the Sri Lankan context, the linkage between the large exporters and the MSMEs play a very important role in terms of uh, promoting the exports as well as the sustaining the, uh, the uh, livelihood of those who are connected to the agri-food systems. And when we look at Sri Lanka's uh, agri-food sector portfolio that was uh, presented today by Nimesha, so she gave a very good example of what are some of the key products and what are some of the emerging and lucrative products in terms of you know, production, consumption and exports. When we had initial discussions, because as the Ceylon Chamber, uh, as we are linked with a larger network of both large and uh, MSME uh, businesses within our uh, chamber, we reached out to them to understand the impacts and what were uh, the, the mechanisms that they sort of worked out in order to, to face the challenges of the pandemic. So the insight that we received through the engagements we had from them was that those MSMEs or even far segments who were in um, some sort of arrangement with large exporters, either through say a buyback agreement or through uh, an outgrower model, were somewhat in a better situation compared to those who worked. So we all know that during the initial phase of the pandemic, there were, you know, uh, large losses, especially crop waste in especially the vegetable sector. Sometimes it was as high as 70 to 80 percent. So if I take that specific example and elaborate a little bit, we see that the MSMEs or the farmers who were connected with the large exporters through buyback agreements actually uh, were less vulnerable because the large firms had to honor the agreements that they had with these uh, MSMEs. And 
that they that ensure a regular cash inflow to the uh, farm level and their messages. And also those who are connected with, uh, say, our grower models benefited in some way because there were certain instances, even in export markets, especially the um, uh, processed uh, food products, uh, witnessed a hike in demand. Because, for example, when you look at the key markets uh, for processed food in Sri Lanka, like the euro, there were uh, lockdowns uh, implemented uh, in most parts of Europe, and there was a hike in demand for some of the processed foods that were imported into these countries. So whoever who were connected to exporters who were supplying to these channels uh, saw an increase in demand coming for their products. So that was really something that really came out as a positive and also uh, elaborated on the importance of having some sort of a formal arrangement when you engage in agri-food sector networks. And also, I'd like to also uh, speak a little bit about um, how the uh, large export network and the MSME working together can really facilitate the, the export uh, of the Sri Lanka. Of Sri Lanka. Uh, how I see this is that actually this linkage is a springboard for uh, MSMEs to become exporters on their own, as that system of support gives them a better exposure to how the exports take place internationally to understand what are the quality parameters that they need to comply with the global compliance requirements, certain uh, exposure to finance models as well as the risk factors that they will have to face on their own when they become exporters themselves one day. So thank you. Okay, uh, this is this is very useful. I was able to follow most of it. Maybe it's only me. Um, you are you are you are breaking a little bit while you are talking. Maybe it's your equipment that you are using. Uh, but I could get the uh, broader perspective of the uh, outgrower model that uh, came into rescue, and also the linkages with the large businesses. We'll come back to those specific issues, uh, uh, Ms. Jayani. Uh, but let's move on to uh, Mr. Roshan Rajadurai, who is a well-known man uh, person in the in the tea industry, particularly is the managing director of plantation sector in Hales PLC. Uh, uh, Dr. Roshan, please welcome. And and uh, we particularly want to know about the tea industry and which is uh, the major uh, exporter from Sri Lanka and and what implications uh, this COVID-19 brought to the uh, tea industry, particularly in the context of uh, um, uh, the restrictions and, and the measures uh, that uh, the tea industry um, made uh, in response to COVID-19. Let's start with that. Um, and and, and, and uh, maybe we'll come back to more details on that. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Roshan, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Babu. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen about COVID, I don't want to elaborate on briefly summarize to say that the key industry, as Professor Jivika said, uh, initially the government mandated a curfew for three days. That was the only time the industry was not working. Immediately, government recognized the need for export uh, earnings and uh, made key industry also an important industry. And thereafter, uh, this is one normality of the uh, tea uh, estates have their worker populations resident and in the smallholder sector, which is 75% of our national tea uh, production and uh, grown, grow, growing area, the workers are in adjacent areas. So with the support of all government and other state institutions, people were able to carry on their normal activities. So much so since March, unless there were interprovincial uh, restrictions in terms of moving from one province to another or some local restrictions, uh, work on the estates, I would say, was almost near normal. In order to undergird this normalcy, I must acknowledge the support and the coordination of all stakeholders, the private sector, the producer sector, the Colombo factories and packers, export sector, the government, health, law enforcement, all came together and facilitated the normals in these areas. Both uh, tea is grown in 14 districts of Sri Lanka out of 25. And this is the only crop that is grown in all the three elevations in Sri Lanka. 
what is significant is in the uh, organized sector we have about 1 million people resident within the states and in the smallholder sector scattered in these 14 districts there are 450000 operators apart from the people engaged in 500 other uh, private factories so overall 1 million in the organized sector and about 1 and a half million in the smallholder sector more than 10% of our population is some or other intricately connected to the tea industry so i am pleased to say that uh, over the period since march 2020 up to now the industry has maintained its normalcy following all the protocols all the guidelines all the statutory requirements required to face this pandemic what is significant is that uh, as professor jivika mentioned the the trade came together and initiated the electronic auction system which is now uh, going on well and in the organized sector in the plantation sector where we had 1 million people the plantation management was quick off the mark we quickly organized the health requirements in terms of logistics for the workers uh, distancing hand washing face mask soap and uh, fumigation of houses and most important thing is at the time when the pandemic was spreading we ensured that they are food because as a resident population they usually congregate in bazaars and townships for their food we ensured that each household was given the required food uh, packed in a bag to their doorstep so this is something unique because not only did we look after the directly employed workers we looked after 1 million resident population so successfully that up till end of last year we did have a single case of covid because we monitored people coming in and out and also this was a time as uh, presenter mentioned yes last year was a bad uh, in terms of quantity for the tea industry that is merely because we had a very very uh, tough uh, first quarter or four months because we had an unprecedented drought perhaps worse in the last 20 years or so that had a significant impact about 40 percent crop drop in the first half so that impacted for the year's production and on the positive side because of the lockdowns there is a natural migration from the states to the cities for work uh, people don't like to engage in agriculture work but because of the lockdown and restrictions to work in the cities and townships we had a reverse migration so the industry was able to absorb all these people and what is significant is the industry ensured that livelihoods earnings in terms of pay advances food stuff everything was maintained at normalcy and the industry continued in its normal pace so that is uh, my brief summary of what happened during the covid thank you thank you dr roshan you are giving a, a very uh, uh, interesting perspective um compared to uh, the general kind of story that we tell what 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 happened in terms of supply respects so you are talking about uh, particularly an industry that is uh, uh, very key for the economy uh, of uh, sri lanka both in terms of employment uh, as well as uh, uh, the trade uh, importance that tea has <coughs> and uh, the measures that were taken uh, to protect the laborers and and particularly from the shock uh, to ensure the industry functions normally so that uh, the export is not uh, disturbed uh, is a, a unique story in itself. Uh, but then on the other hand, you also brought in this uh, drought as, as a factor that contribute uh, the, the, the COVID and, and the drought. Uh, you were able to handle one of the, one of the uh, shocks, uh, but still uh, the drought related shocks, we, we can explain that as we go along. But this is, a, uh, this is a very interesting perspective that you, you brought in. So we'll we'll move on. We'll come back to you. Uh, maybe there will be some questions uh, uh, related to that. Um, so we, we move to the next uh, um, panelist. Uh, uh, we have uh, Ms. Shubhashini Abesinghe. Uh, Shubhashini is a research director in Verite uh, Research. And um, uh, she has been a trade economist there. Uh, Mr. Bashni, uh, we wanted to uh, understand from your perspective, particularly um, uh, how trade facilitation measures uh, could play a role, particularly in helping countries to build back uh, probably better uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, the better trade relationship uh, and, and uh, better trade policies, better trade uh, policy reforms. Uh, from moving from the emergencies towards building a resilient 
trade system. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the major domestic barriers related to trade in Sri Lanka and how trade facilitation particularly can help improve the situation, uh, um, going towards resilience uh, from the shock that we had. Um, Ms. Subhashini, please. Thank you very much. Uh, because I have uh, very little time, I will just try to cover uh, as much as possible because trade facilitation is an area that is important regardless of what sector you're operating in. But I believe in agriculture, it is more important than other sectors for two reasons. One is agriculture tend to be more heavily regulated, agriculture trade compared to other sectors, and for good reasons as well, because it affects consumers' life, health, uh, plant, animal life, health, environment. So there are good reasons for uh, uh, good, good regulations in the agriculture sector. But at the same time, that means the efficiency, effectiveness of the manner in which these regulations are introduced and, and uh, operated becomes critically important for your agriculture trade competitiveness. Secondly, it is also very important because of the nature of the agriculture products, especially the perishable nature. That means time is of essence for agriculture traders, and that is why I I believe for any country in to ensure that you get uh, you get your food inputs on time in good quality as well as inputs for your agriculture production as well as exports um, the competitiveness timeliness affordability all of these are affected by trade facilitation measures because what com cumbersome complex inefficient uh, time consuming processes does is that it increases the cost and time of trading and that is why trade facilitation becomes much more important for agriculture trade compared to other sectors. But in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, while trade facilitation has been discussed widely, we have made very little progress in actually facilitating trade. If you, especially in agriculture sector, the, the, the simplification, automation of uh, the trade procedures uh, remains still far behind some compared to even our neighbors. And, and um, that is, so what COVID-19 does in my view, while there are lots of disruptions, it in, in the area of trade facilitation, I think it demonstrated the value and the importance of trade facilitation to actually withstand this kind of uh, this kind of shocks when your physical mobility is limited when your physical interactions are limited uh, the the ability to function online uh, that that understanding and the value becomes uh, much more important even on physical inspection we have frequently said in perishable goods you should really reduce the uh, percentage of goods that you have to physically inspect regularly but and and there is one measure that uh, any trade facilitator would tell you is adopt good risk uh, assessment systems and procedures but in sri lanka most of our agencies especially in and those agencies that overlook agriculture sector does not have good risk assessment systems in place which requires much more extensive physical inspection of goods which is not really possible during times like this pandemic and and it should not be discouraged even under normal uh, circumstances than what is required so so and excessive physical inspection is frequently cited as a problem for traders for example exporters even on normal circumstances would tell you that they're subject to four separate physical inspections uh, when they're trying to take goods out of the port we have Sri Lanka Air Force that is checking then you have the the plant quarantine that is uh, that does uh, the physical inspection then you have the Sri Lanka customs and then airport security. So, so frequently traders would say having to have, go through physical inspections at four different places where there are no temperature controlled areas and the officers who are doing the checking is not properly trained to handle uh, the, 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 the perishable cargo. Then this itself affects the uh, quality and time of the uh, timeliness of the, of the, uh, the cargo that when it reaches the final destination. So, 
so even under normal conditions, we were lagging behind. There was a lot of room to improve. And, and hopefully the COVID-19 pandemic would have uh, emphasized the importance of, of these measures being in place. And, and there were many agencies. I mean, I found it pleasantly surprised. I did certain consultations uh, in relation to agriculture border measures during the pandemic. And it was very nice to see all of the government officials willing to come online uh, to the consultations, right? And and which was which is not something I would have expected that of most officials would be willing to do under normal circumstances. And we know there was not much emphasis given actually to provide them good connectivity. There were many instances traders would say their emails don't function. I mean, you have to operate still with fax machines. You have to operate still physically. So, so they, I mean, this uh, electronic communication, which today is almost like something that you have to do and and it is not even uh, you know it's it's a simple technology that everybody should have but i hopefully what i would like to see is that the government the emphasis the government gave to bring the government uh, uh, agencies and the officials to be able to function online and there was this um, there was uh, you know there was everyone was like surprised when when government announced oh you know the government officials will work from home and there was like this shock oh you know they could not work online even when they were at office and now you're telling us they're going to work from home online right but but it was actually there was i i know it wasn't perfect but it was better than normal there was an effort to make sure that they are they can be connected online and that was to me that was evident simply by the fact as a researcher when i wanted to do they were willing to come on zoom they were willing to come on teams they were willing to really um, you know, connect with you from even from home. Uh, so, so I think this is something we should not uh, really uh, let it backslide, right? What happens is when things back to normal get back to normal, people think, oh, you know, we can go back to doing all these uh, transactions as we do before, uh, paper based and physical. But actually, you know, we should continue that even government officials may have found new value and they may have realized that this is more efficient, more productive. Uh, and uh, and in this, there should be continuous um, uh, pressure, even from the private sector, to, to really go move towards this direction and not shift back to the old way of doing business and this is to me one thing that COVID-19 should have you know basically one of the silver linings uh, in, in COVID-19 and especially for a country like Sri Lanka that is that has made very very little progress in, in, uh, in, in introducing trade facilitation measures. Uh, thank you Suresh. Thank you wonderful wonderful Subhashini. Uh, I, I think um, we also see this as uh, Dr. Dushini said uh, in the beginning, what are the innovations, induced innovations that can come out of COVID-19 as an opportunity, right? So when you look at that, there is a clear example that you are giving that uh, that, that that facilitating, regulating and, and organizations can actually go digital uh, quickly with this opportunity and then make progress in terms of moving from the old archaic way of doing things to modern way of doing things that can facilitate trade and, and uh, that's fantastic uh, kind of perspective and insight. Um, you hang in there, we'll come back to you if you have time and, and talk more about it. Uh, fascinating uh, insights there. But let me um, quickly move on to our last panelist, uh, Dr. Asanka uh, Vijay Singhe, uh, who is also with IPS. Uh, 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 Dr. Asanka, we, we would like to know from your perspective uh, in a broader context of uh, what is happening in the region, particularly with the trade partners of Sri Lanka, how their performance has affected Sri Lanka uh, in the context of food agri uh, export uh, earnings. Um, what do you see from, 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 from that perspective of uh, what is happening in other countries and how it impacts as trading partners with Sri Lanka? Uh, Dr. Asanka, please. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Bob. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the agricultural uh, trade was pretty much resilient in the pandemic. Uh, the restriction was uh, 
the contraction, agricultural trade contraction was just about uh, 2%. Of course, uh, there are, were a uh, disaggregated uh, impact, disproportionate impact uh, on uh, different sectors. There is this uh, USDA report recently. It shows that though uh, at the aggregate level, uh, the uh, trade contraction was uh, minimal. There were, were certain sectors affected by this, uh, especially uh, the uh, pandemic-related uh, mobility restrictions. Uh, however, uh, the important fact is that uh, this uh, global trade uh, did not re require uh, much of human contact. So this health, this was a health shock. The idea was to uh, keep distance. So the at the beginning of uh, uh, June, July of uh, 2020, the global uh, trade uh, rebounded. Even uh, the uh, most uh, sophisticated uh, production lines like uh, vehicle, not only uh, the agricultural uh, products. Uh, the IMF data source on this uh, uh, ships emitting uh, signals uh, to, in port calls, they showed that uh, uh, there is, was a sharp uh, rebound uh, and we were back to the trend uh, at 2021 uh, January. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Sri Lanka's uh, exports uh, to uh, our trade uh, partners, uh, our key trade partners are actually not in the uh, region. Uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, trade partners away from uh, the region like uh, US uh, and uh, the EU. Uh, initially, uh, at around uh, 2020 March, our exports uh, went down, but uh, we rebounded back uh, to uh, 2020 in 2020 uh, July. As an example, overall uh, agricultural uh, trade, if you look at the numbers, in Sri Lanka, uh, 2019 October, I took that uh, month, taking it as a normal month, uh, without any effect from the pandemic. Our monthly agricultural exports was about uh, two, 210 uh, million USD dollars. It was reduced uh, to about uh, 122. It was sharp reduction by 2020 March, but due to uh, the global conditions, uh, the rebound of uh, the shipping. Uh, and uh, previous panelists spoke about the domestic uh, measures taken not to uh, interrupt uh, the agricultural uh, production. We recovered uh, it back to uh, around uh, July. Uh, uh, we exported about 229 million USD dollars. Same goes with tea, seafood, and uh, uh, rubber. Uh, spices, those are the exports uh, we have a comparative advantage uh, uh, in agricultural uh, sector. If you look at uh, the uh, EU market, also uh, the same trend uh, we are witnessing around uh, March, February, uh, there was a deep plunge, but we rebounded back to the normal uh, trend around uh, June and uh, July. Uh, the, uh, what we need to uh, look at is i think uh, what will happen in the future uh, rebounding back to the trend is not enough we need to grow from that uh, point uh, because uh, about one quarter of our uh, population is uh, the workforce is uh, living on uh, agricultural uh, sector uh, dependent on livelihood as uh, nimesha showed uh, very uh, correctly uh, the eu economy is uh, rebounding the global post Effective uh, WTO predictions of trade and everything are good for 2022. Uh, actually, uh, the WTO painted a gloomy picture uh, of the impact of uh, COVID on uh, trade, but uh, uh, we actually realized about 5.3 contraction. The, the prediction saw about 30, no, sometimes 32 percent of contraction. We uh, in in uh, in the world, uh, the trade uh, was much resilient than uh, the other sectors. In the EU, our vital uh, uh, export market, the 2021 uh, GDP growth is predicted as about 5%, and uh, 2022, it will be about 4.3%, and their unemployment level is also going down. That means the demand will be favorable for our products in uh, the EU market. 
and in the us also about uh, they are about uh, 5.6 uh, growth prediction for 2021 but we need to um, uh, keep in mind that this uh, comparison is uh, with 2020 uh, which uh, witnessed a severe uh, economic uh, contraction uh, given that uh, conditions i think uh, 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 c- compared to other sectors our agriculture sector was minimally affected especially exports and even globally agriculture sector trade was uh, resilient uh, our trade partners are doing uh, well uh, in 2021 and their prospects of uh, growth are also better for 2021 so i think our future is good but there is this uh, supply chain issue uh, especially the lack of uh, containers uh, i had a talk with one of my friend uh, in uh, this uh, desiccated coconut uh, production she told me that uh, there is no enough containers uh, to export uh, products sri lanka is facing that uh, there are multiple factors uh, rebounding the demand and uh, the domestic issues even in uh, countries like the uh, us uh, but there are reports that there are piled up containers in the western countries and we don't have containers the government like sri lanka we cannot do much about that i think there should be a global partnership to uh, correct that uh, issue but there are some domestic policies compounding uh, this effect as an example we have import restrictions so we don't get enough containers to the country uh, that those things i think sri lanka should uh, consider so that is my uh, broad uh, out uh, broad uh, assessment about the global trend in the region and uh, the, our trade partners thank you thank you thank you dr asanka uh, generally in the first round of uh, uh, panelists uh, responses have been elaborate uh, and uh, to the uh, yet uh, to the point uh, uh and it gave us uh, different perspectives and uh, dr sanka your perspective is that, that it look, it's looking good uh, as we go forward uh, but with some uh, caution that unless we uh, ease the restrictions in terms of the containers for example logistical restrictions we may uh, face uh, challenges as well and that seems to be a global issue as well for, by the way container issue is a global issue and um, you brought the nice perspective of if you don't import where the containers are going to come from uh, for you to export right so that's a, that's a very good perspective there and then in the next round i know uh, we are uh, going to open it up for um, the answer and uh, question and answer session i'm going to ask uh, the participants uh, who are out there to go ahead and put your questions in the chat we'll uh, we'll go to that uh, in in few minutes um in the second round uh, as as the participants put in their questions or even they, they can raise the hand later on uh, but preferably you put the put the hand there and i'm going to be asking panelists to be quickly responding to uh, some of the follow up questions that we have for you uh, in, a, in a, a rather in a brief manner uh, i know professor uh, jivika has to leave for another meeting uh, soon so i'm going to start with her again um professor jivika uh, we are interested in uh, we talked about fertilizer import ban and and how that is kind of uh, relaxed a little bit but it's not really sure whether we are uh, still on the ban situation and and so on but um, how do we in general um, work towards improving the role of institutions and towards trade policy reforms in sri lanka that is required to build resiliency in our trade um briefly please and um, we can always uh, talk about this yeah. <laughs> at length but yeah, i'll try, try to be brief but i want to give you a preamble so i think sure. uh, in answering a question like this uh, we have to first think uh, what is it that uh, we want to achieve do we uh, want to uh, have more and more exports or uh, do we want to have toxic uh, free food or do we uh, need to have uh, food uh, that is produced locally using local raw materials so i think we have to first set the target so as a development economist uh, what i think is that uh, we want to see a world uh, where the living standards are better and uh, without compromising uh, the future generation we we want to make sure that uh, we all will be in a better place uh, once we Uh, implement the strategies that we discussed so I, I i think that is where we should be heading 
Then the question is that how do we align our agriculture sector to reach this goal? So in, in uh, looking at uh, agriculture sectors, like particularly when we look at uh, how uh, other countries uh, reached such uh, status, like uh, of course uh, developing countries can learn a lot from developed countries and uh, even though there are no hard and fast rules, we can see that almost all the countries have undergone a structural change and during this uh, structural change, uh, agriculture contribution to GDP and also employment uh, in agriculture have been declining. So we have to find out a way to facilitate this uh, transition. So the question is that uh, what kind of policies uh, we should uh, implement so as to speed up this uh, transition or skip some of the stages in uh, this transition. So for that uh, we have to very well understand where we are right now. So if we are at a very early stages of development, of course, we need to boost our agriculture production. So we should uh, uh, have land uh, settlement policies, irrigation policies, credit policies, like uh, very, very much uh, input oriented policies to pour more and more inputs to agriculture sector. And uh, we might also need to do this uh, with the uh, heavy import restrictions because we have to make sure that domestic uh, in domestic industries pick up so those prescriptions are good for countries which are in early stages of development but right now in sri lanka we actually see this kind of policies but we are not in that stage so we have passed that stage we have come to a state uh, where uh, what we need are more innovative and uh, novel policies, uh, institutions and technologies to speed up this uh, uh, transition. So in my view, uh, what we need is basically to connect to uh, high-end uh, domestic uh, supply chains as well as uh, global supply chains. So all what we do should be to connect uh, our small scale farmers to uh, supply chains and uh, even though uh, we have passed the early stages uh, we have a long way to go because uh, still 25 percent of our labor force is in agriculture and most of them are small scale farmers so we need the uh, novel approaches and uh, we need to bring in uh, foreign direct uh, investment and uh, investors do not like to uh, invest in agriculture one of the biggest reasons is that uh, the policy environment is so uncertain. So we have to make sure that even with the high taxes, we have to give them uh, a predictable uh, environment. Then only uh, they will, uh, they will uh, spend uh, in uh, our country. And uh, climate change uh, is a huge problem. So we will have to help uh, farmers uh, to uh, adapt to climate change shocks. And uh, more than uh, production oriented, very inward looking policies, we should try to uh, find out export markets. Uh, we should uh, diversify our exports. And also uh, we should uh, try our best to make use of all these digital technologies uh, to uh, streamline uh, the issues in uh, marketing, uh, uh, marketing chains. Uh, and I think uh, we should uh, get rid of some of the rigid policies like uh, food self-sufficiency. Of course, uh, as a jargon, it is good. But when you look at uh, our policies, like we have 13 priority crops and uh, uh, among these crops, we have very, very unprofitable, socially unprofitable crops. So we are dragging mm -hmm. inputs unnecessarily to these, mm -hmm. uh, uh, these sectors uh, by having such policies and programs. Uh, and uh, I mentioned about this uh, home gardening uh, program. Actually, home gardening is good. My worry is that uh, why we use taxpayers' money uh, for home gardening, like uh, these are small production units. And there are areas where we need to support uh, home gardens, but uh, most of our attempts are pretty much uh, untargeted. So we have to provide targeted assistance uh, and uh, supermarkets uh, are coming up and contract farming uh, should be uh, 
uh, facilitated than right now supermarkets also like us go to uh, uh, wholesale markets and uh, collect their supplies uh, so 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 we we need to uh, improve connections uh, and uh, also uh, loss making uh, state owned enterprises is a huge issue so government procurement and uh, the businesses that the government uh, does uh, will will uh, have to be streamlined and uh, mm. lastly about the fertilizer ban like uh, we we really need to get rid of some of uh, uh, the policies uh, that uh, do more harm than good yeah, exactly oh, thank you thank you dr uh, jivika and and uh, thank you for joining this panel and i know you have another meeting to go uh, but uh, but but we'll come back to you as in a larger sense to to see how uh, uh, your ideas and uh, your writings can be actually translated into some policy discussion with the policy makers as we go along thank you so much let me quickly move on to uh, as uh, the thank participants uh, put their questions on the chat box we will come come back to that um, as well uh, um, we are, we are just going to quickly get a, a question for uh, dr roshan um, um, dr roshan the question is the government put a proposal with the budget few days ago on introducing new laws on the usage of lands owned by the plantation companies um is this is still a bit vague do you have any predictions on this and have uh, they consulted industry people like you for example before coming up with this proposal um how would you see the impact of such changes uh, in the land laws on the industry as a whole in the future uh, dr roshan yes, uh, yes. is not a new proposal in fact about uh, so now years back government said that the uncultivated land the plantation sector would be looked at and uh, uh, used for some other purpose but the fact of the matter is our industry is over 150 years old uh, thanks to the <laughs> colonial uh, planters every possible inch potential inch uh, of uh, commercial crop cultivation has been utilized the uncultivated land are uncultivable because they are slab rock uh, uh, earth slip road areas or reservations or things like that so we do not see what uh, other uh, aim they have in mind of course there are unproductive and uneconomical tea lands over 100 years so we are not uh, fully aware of what the intention is but to give an assurance that in sri lanka in the larger plantation estates every inch of possible cultivable land is cultivated if not for tea rubber or any other commercial crop at least fuel loop touch banks uh, preservation commercial forestry all that is uh, productively used that's that's what i can say so we are unaware of the actual intention uh, probably they may have an idea i believe that there are component of estates uh, managed by the state they are very unproductive unprofitable and a drain on the treasury possibly they might uh, look at those estates to be diverted away from their co crops of tea wonderful wonderful thank you I, and and as uh, i'm very conscious of time as well and uh, questions are coming in uh, please post your questions and and the uh, panelists can also respond uh, directly to your chats on the chat section uh, but in the meantime i want to bring in uh, bring back uh, ms vashini um, you uh, are a researcher working in a um, leading think tank in sri lanka um how do you see the role of uh, think tanks particularly in terms of uh, generating evidence and influencing policy um uh, in, in sri lanka in achieving um a, a, an equitable recovery from this pandemic you talked about the, the the sector regulatory sector and how it can transform itself but broadly how think tanks can play that role that's that's one of the questions that's coming in uh, ms subhashini please thank you i think one of the things that we see uh, lacking in policy making process in sri lanka is use of data and science and this is critically important in any sector and in agriculture sector even more important we are talking about actually agriculture sector for long has been viewed as a non high tech sector right non tech sector but in reality with climate change and the challenges the sector is facing it is uh, critically important to view it as a sector that requires technology to withstand the climate change and greater use of data 
unfortunately i think uh, we have to one of the things that the think tanks uh, and especially the scientists agriculture scientists in the country can do is really uh, you know ch change our policy making culture where very little science and data is used and agriculture sector policy is very heavily politicized i guess not just in sri lanka in many countries as well and in sri lanka it is even more so because although our sector contributes less than 10% of gdp around 25% of the population's li livelihood depends on it and which makes it a very important vote bank for any politician and can make or break your election being right so so that also leads to the sector being heavily politicized and then the decisions are made on political basis than on good economic uh, and sound data analysis i think really driving that conversation of uh, of the importance of incorporating more science and and um, data and also incorporating technology into the sector and making this uh, this uh, agriculture policy making more multi sectoral you need to have scientists you need to have climate uh, change specialists you need to have even software people especially big data on environment change rain patterns all of these uh, the, the the software technology it people can contribute a lot but in sri lanka we uh, still don't have that kind of multi uh, sector you know um, um, analysis you know expertise from every sector being brought into uh, policy making maybe maybe as think tanks and scientists we can collaborate and really really create the you know emphasize the importance of doing so and and the risks the country is going to face if we fail to really incorporate data science and technology into our policy making thank you thank you so much uh, subhashini and and i can see dr asanka already responding to some of the questions particularly on the non trade barrier question uh, coming from cambodia i believe thanks for answering that but in the meantime let me ask ms jayani to talk a little bit more about how can we help the uh, smes uh, or how can we strengthen them uh in order to contribute more to the food and agricultural sector broadly uh but what lesson that we learned from this perspective you talked about the outgrower scheme uh, and so on but but uh, from from what we observe um what how can we help them to play a better role in the uh, agri food export sector uh, ms jayani please Uh, thank you very much dr suresh um so i think um, there were very um, interesting uh, insights uh, that were uh, brought to this discussion by by eminent panelists on this regard so just to add uh, on to the ongoing discussion i think it's very important uh, for us to really understand how we really navigate this new normal together um so when you look at the the how the agri uh, food sector functions in sri lanka i think it's very important for us to have accelerated policy interventions for targeted uh, trade facilitation measures so subhashini even prof sajivika uh, very correctly uh, highlighted the importance of um having you know different digitization uh, initiatives to drive the the agri uh, food export business in sri lanka so why it's important is uh, i think digitization is a key driver especially for the smes uh, to bring down their business costs to improve the transparency on how international uh, trade operates and also to speed up the the international cross border trade process so in this regard i think uh, the Uh, agri food sector is going to be uh, one of the biggest beneficiaries of digitization because on one hand we deal with a product that is um, either perishable or has, has a relatively uh, smaller shelf life compared to many other products and sri lanka is um, actually forefronting um, some of uh, such uh, facilitation measures um, especially in the implementation of the wto trade facilitation um, agreement as well so just focusing on that a little bit i would like to also uh, share with our audience today like uh, the ceylon chamber also as a key uh, facilitator in implementation of this agreement is uh, supporting the government in implementing a national single window which i believe is a key uh, facilitator in driving this digitization process in cross border trade and the agri food sector will be a, one of the biggest beneficiaries of that 
And then um, I would like to also bring to your attention the importance of providing very targeted support to our regional SME, especially in the agri-food uh, business. So when we talk about uh, regional MSNEs, what we understand is that they uh, lack technical know-how and they also um, lack sufficient human resources that are vital for driving the export business. And when you really under try to understand the export issues that they face, we have um, really seen that they have less knowledge on uh, the technical requirements of the international trade like uh, mandatory certification requirements what are the input terms that they need to use what are the payment terms that they need to use what sort of insurance terms they have to comply with then even the hs codes what are the customs duties that they have to pay what are the potential trade agreements and, uh, make use of and how to complete let's say an export audit how to uh, understand what are the target markets that they need to reach out to and what are the market entry strategies that they need to use so there are so many issues like that where they lack technical expertise in so i believe um, there are certain interventions that the government can lead from a public sector point of view but there are many other interventions especially as a business facilitation chambers that we can also uh, do as proactive measures so that we can really support our msmes at a firm level to strengthen their uh, case in becoming more competitive exporters uh, globally and in this regard i would like to also just share um, some numbers with you we all know that there are many export facilitation agencies uh, that are operating at the ground level in sri lanka including the export development board which has um, a team of 300 export development officers who are linked to regional development so across all 25 districts there are 300 export development officers who are working to promote uh, exports so the chamber um, recognizing this um, have linked with the government and also th with our international uh, facilitators and through these partnerships are looking at some of the proactive things that we can do to strengthen the MSMEs at the ground level so that they can become, they will be empowered and they will uh, be competitive exporters when they enter into the export business. And thirdly, Dr. Suresh also uh, answering to your question about different uh, business models. Um, I would like to um, share with you a few uh, examples on some of the potential business models that we can look at to strengthen the agri-food export case in Sri Lanka. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, there is uh, one model where we can look at like, you know, contracting farmers with both the backward and forward linkages, where the facilitation will come through a large business uh, that's in the export business. And apart from that, there can also be other contracted arrangements where the large exporters can really provide guaranteed price and quantity for the MSMEs that are linked to their business chains. And another interesting um, a model that we can explore is you know, how these uh, large businesses can uh, uh, interact directly with our farmers at the economic collection centers because as we all know there are many middlemen who are involved in at the uh, economic uh, collection centers and therefore sometimes there are many uh, gray areas uh, when it comes to really uh, passing on the profits to that farmer level or the msme level so therefore i think there can be more uh, digitization and more interventions in how these open purchase agreements can be operated even at the collection center level and finally i would like to also uh, bring to your notice about the productivity based wage models uh, this also includes the outgrower systems as well and this has been something that even the plantation sector has been uh, discussing over the last decade or so and i think dr roshan would also contribute to uh, you know how this can really bring in more efficiencies to our agri-food systems because then the, the farm the msme would be empowered and they will be a drive for them to really uh, get the best share out of that productivity based model so thank you very much Thank you. This is, this is a very useful uh, uh, and, and also elaborate uh, 
uh, feedback uh, uh, on the SMEs, how we can help them uh, as we move forward. At this point, uh, because we are running short of time, um, I would like to ask the participants, if you want to raise your hand and ask any questions for the panelists or for the presenter, please uh, do so. We may take one or two questions before I uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Manoj uh, so for, for closing remarks. Uh, any other uh, feedback or uh, questions that the participants have, please? In the absence of any questions, I just want to highlight some of the things that we have been talking about. Uh, to me, it is fascinating. I mean, it's, it's a very detailed uh, and, and uh, uh, very focused discussion on um, the trade issues in Sri Lanka. We started with the uh, issue of emergency versus long term and how this pandemic has brought an opportunity, not just a challenge for um, induced innovation, for example. Uh, and, and, and also, um, we moved on to talk about how domestic policies, domestic, domestic uh, 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 interventions and strategies can have far reaching implications for trade and, and trade policies as well. Um, we talked about the logistics issues. Uh, we talked about uh, how to uh, help the, the small, micro uh, and medium enterprises yeah. um, and in, in trade, uh, uh, in the role in connecting with the, with the economy as well as broadly with the larger businesses as well as in trade. Um, we talked about how to digitize the system in terms of better facilitation, moving from the archaic way of doing things, uh, which is actually uh, detrimental to the trade facilitation and towards um, uh, digitization and to make uh, um, the system modern. And we also talked about uh, the positive things about how the responses have been, particularly in the tea sector, how uh, although there was major disruptions but the tea sector really stood up and, and, and contributed without uh, any major uh, disruptions coming from particularly the COVID-19 uh, uh, lockdown related uh, disruptions. Um, so that's, that's uh, uh, another uh, insight there. And we also talked about the outgrower models, how we can adjust uh, the uh, system to meet the emerging demands. Um, and uh, we are also looking forward to how the uh, short term policies uh, that the government make could be guided through evidence based data based the big data ba uh, analysis for uh, translating uh, knowledge base into meaningful policies and that can be followed up with uh, proper investments in, in making the sector work uh, in terms of trade in terms of production in terms of processing and also reaching the consumers um uh, at the end of it uh, of the of the food system chain uh with that uh, kind of overview there is a lot more that has been recorded in terms of your inputs um uh, our participants from uh, cambodia and laos they they are also uh, uh listening and and because they are also conducting similar uh, studies and and uh, we'll be sharing their studies also with with colleagues in uh, in sri lanka as well uh, with that uh, a bit of a summary, it's very difficult to summarize this elaborate and detailed discussions we have. But uh, with with a little bit of these highlights, let me turn it over uh, to to the organizers, uh, and then uh, we'll uh, listen from uh, Dr. Manoj at this stage. Um, uh, Hiruni, if you are continuing to moderate, please back to you. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Uh, now we have come to the end of today's session and uh, to deliver the vote of thanks, now I cordially invite Dr. Manoj Tibbadwava, Research Fellow at IPS, to deliver the vote of thanks. 
good good morning good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, actually it is indeed a privilege for me to take this uh, opportunity to thank all those who have contributed uh, towards making the webinar a success uh, we joined uh, together to discuss in sri lanka's agro trade structure opportunities uh, challenges as well as impacts of covid-19 and uh, probably to provide inputs uh, for the formation of a su successful uh, policy framework for the country um uh, this uh, webinar um brought together stakeholders uh, from different sectors uh, including the public and private sectors uh, academia and researchers uh, who are working in the areas of uh, agri food industry uh, as well as uh, trade so i would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, especially the eminent panel members uh, professor jv kavir hewa uh, dr suresh babu uh, dr roshan rajadure uh, ms uh, subhashini uh, Uh, Ms. Jayani and uh, Dr. Asanka uh, for taking their time off uh, from their uh, busy schedules uh, to join this um, panel and uh, enlighten us with their expert views. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, IPS Executive Director uh, Dr. Dushni Virakon for giving opening remarks and all the participants who made this uh, webinar uh, successful by their. Uh, uh, participation uh, i would also um, like to uh, extend my sincere thanks uh, to uh, dr suresh babu and ms nandita uh, srivastava uh, from ifri uh, washington dc team uh, for offering uh, this training on uh, annual trade flow analysis for ips junior researchers for the last two years um, and uh, guiding them throughout the study uh, special thanks uh, should go to our uh, ips uh, communication team uh, for providing organizational uh, support so um, at the end we hope to make uh, the output of this webinar available in the form of uh, a policy brief so uh, once again and uh, thanking all for participation in the, this event i will uh, i would like to wind up the session have a good day thank you thank you thank you